So I just want to introduce our host today, um, Tom Pawson. So thanks very much, Tom, for taking the time to uh, del deliver this, uh, the second event for yourself uh, this year, uh, all around the scaffold basics and the difference between TG20 and scaffold designs. Uh, so looking at the, the risk management uh, from a technical aspect. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand you over to Tom, but if you do have any questions, please pop them in the chat, who you are, where you're from, and then Bob will pick those up uh, at the end of the presentation. And please, if you do want to obviously leave your camera on, by all means, but if you would be kind enough just to leave your, your mute button on whilst the presentation is going ahead. Thanks very much, Tom. All right. Thank you very much, Fiona. Um, are there people waiting in the in the waiting room. I wasn't sure I've got that on my screen, but... Um, yeah, everybody's yeah. been admitted. Excellent. So yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, and I think, yeah, thanks for uh, inviting me back to talk to you again. It's obviously a few months since I came to talk to you about lifting. Uh, I think I might've mentioned at the time that, that my role is sort of dual. I look after lifting and scaffolding, which when I, um, my, my principal role to start with was, was solely lifting. And for a, a number of reasons, I was then asked if I'd look after the scaffolding for the for the business as well. Um, and I thought, well, the two, the, the two very different things, they'll probably never, never, ever meet. And I was actually surprised by the number of, um, I suppose, incidents, really, that involve both scaffolding and lifting. So people sometimes drop scaffolding when they're picking up with cranes. Um, sometimes they, they're in, incorrectly using lifting equipment on the side of scaffolding. So actually, the two are quite, quite well aligned, which I found really interesting. And so I, I've probably like yourselves, I, I had a, a good working awareness of, of scaffolding um, until I had this role. I'd had it on my sites when I was a project manager. I'd had plenty of scaffolding on my projects before, but I'd never really um, thought in too much detail about the whole design and selection process because I suppose, to be brutally honest, it was somebody else's issue. So um, I didn't need to look into it too much. Obviously, in this role that I've now been in covering scaffolding as well for probably three or four years now, um, I've definitely had to um, to learn more about the the scaffolding industry and how the design and selection process works. So hopefully I'll be able to share some of the some of the insights into that today. So hopefully if this works, bear with me. There we go. Um, so I think I went through this last time. Oh, out, out of interest, is the a banner with everybody's faces appearing on the right hand side for you, like is on my screen? If it's not, yes. then it is. Do you want me to get rid of it? Probably it's kind of blocks the view, doesn't it? There we go. Is that better? That's fine. Yeah, That's cool. fine. Thanks, Rainer. Um, so yeah, just a bit of a, a background. I think if, if you were on the call last time when it was about uh, lifting, a bit of information about Costain. Um, you probably heard of Costain. We were a smart infrastructure solutions company is what we kind of call ourselves at the moment. But fundamentally, we're a, we're a civil engineering company. That's our, that's our background. So we've been around since 1865, um, somewhere between three and 4,000 employees and somewhere around a billion pounds turnover every year. Um, we do lots of different sorts of things now. Obviously, the industry is evolving. So we've got consultancy, advisory, digital stuff, and the sectors we work in are down at the bottom. Um, so me, I've been at Costain for 18 years. I'm a chartered civil engineer, um, fellow of the ICE and a chartered manager. Current role is as chief engineer, and I look after lifting and scaffolding. The terminology designated individual actually is quite, a, it's quite relevant to, to scaffolding because designated individual terminology, of course, comes from and the temporary works procedures and temporary works British standards. So in effect, I am looking after the temporary works element for scaffolding, um, the scaffolding being very much an item of temporary work still. The rest of what I do is all is more to do with lifting. So um, BS7121 and those sorts of things. If you want to get in touch with me, there are my contact details at the bottom. I'm more than happy to, to assist. So that's enough about myself. Um, what I thought we would go through this evening Let's have a look at the work at height regulations and what do they specifically require in relation to scaffolding. We'll then look at the types of scaffolding and um, scaffolding components, typical scaffolding components. Um, let's look at low classes and ties, designed versus compliant scaffolds. You might have come across that terminology before. And then how we manage it at cost in terms of the process of design briefs and scaffolding on site and also how we classify it in terms of temporary works because we mustn't forget that scaffolding is an item of temporary works. And then just to touch on inspection at the end. So I thought I'd put in some some in, uh, some recent or fairly recent incidents now. I mean, this one's 22 years old, but one of the reasons why we manage scaffolding in the way we do, and you might remember the scaffold collapse in, in Cardiff in 2000. It's quite an interesting one or quite a, quite a famous one. Um, 
very fortunately, nobody nobody died in this event. It must have happened um, overnight. But one of the interesting things was this scaffold on the left hand side required 300 ties and only 91 had been installed. There were no ties in the top six meters. Of the 91 ties that had been installed, most of them were installed incorrectly because the people installing them were not trained in how to install and test ties properly. The design was pretty ambiguous. So lots of changes had to be made on site or lots of changes were made either inadvertent or deliberate, but those weren't communicated back to the designer. So there was no check of those. The principal contractor didn't check the scaffold design, also didn't check the scaffolding that had been installed. Um, there was no system for undertaking inspections. And as is a fairly common theme, it failed during high winds. So there's a link there at the top if you wanted to find some more information on that one. This one's a bit more recent. Um, I can't remember what year it is now, but this is the jury's in the Milton Keynes being built. Um, unfortunately, this one, one person did die and there were two um, su uh, substantial injuries as well. Um, the, the, the three people who were injured, one of them which died, fell about 40 metres, um, so it was obviously horrific. What was found in the, in the aftermath was that the scaffolding was not strong or stable enough for the works being carried out. There, there had been loading bays on the um, scaffold previously, and some of the loading bays had been removed, probably uh, quite possibly from a, um, a cost perspective which had forced some of the materials that were being kept on the loading base to be loaded out onto the scaffold itself, which caused the scaffold to be overloaded. There had been some very um, specific instructions given by the HSC, which is quite interesting. So before the scaffold collapsed, this was already slightly in the spotlight anyway from the HSC, they were looking at this. Um, and again, failed during high winds. Now, I don't know much about this one, but this is this one, one which comes up on BBC News pretty much straight away. So another one which is blown over during high winds. Um, I don't know why it blew over, but this obviously had the potential to fall across streets and hurt people. Um, again, nobody injured, luckily. I found this one on the Irish magazine, actually. Um, a scaffold that had been designed as a, um, a standard configuration, and we'll look at what that means in a bit, but a standard configuration where a standard configuration shouldn't have been used, had not been adequately tied and was not strong enough to withstand the foreseeable wind loads again failed during high winds so wind is a common theme with with scaffolding so okay hope that, that sort of whets your appetite um so let's have a look at the work at height regulations and i'm sure being irish members you'll be pretty familiar with these at the back of the work at high regulations in schedule three um it tells you for working platforms we're talking about scaffolds for example whatever it sits on needs to be stable and of sufficient strength to support whatever's being put on it now that's pretty pretty obvious pretty straightforward and then it goes on to talk about the actual scaffold and it says that strength and stability calculations for the scaffolding need to be carried out unless, and this is the wording in the, in the schedule, and note of the calculations covering the structural arrangements contemplated is available. So what that means is you need to carry out calculations unless you've already carried them out. So there's an example of some calculations with the drawing. So that's a designed scaffold. But you've got another option. The other option is you can assemble in conformity with a generally recognized standard configuration. That's a bit of a mouthful. Um, as an industry, what we tend to see generally recognized standard configurations as is the TG20 compliance sheets. So there's an example of a compliance sheet on the right-hand side. And we'll look at those in a little bit more detail later on. So types of scaffold. Um, the most common one in the UK is the tube and fitting scaffold, which I'm sure you'll have, I don't need to tell you what tube and fitting scaffold is, but obviously made of standard diameter tubes held together with standard fittings. And can, the fittings can be put in any location. So you can accommodate any, well, say almost any, almost any shape, size and loading with a tube and fitting scaffold. So those are the most prevalent ones in the UK. Um, in Europe, and we do see these in the UK, but in Europe, the, um, the, the preference is for what we call system scaffolds. Um, the UK industry is just not really, it, we, we do use system scaffoldings, but, but not to the same extent. So a system scaffold is made from, made from modular units. So you can see on the, on the picture, you've got standards, ledgers, and transoms, and they're basically all prefabricated units. So you can't fit these in any position you want. They have to go into the, into the system, um, the system fixing. So held together in predetermined locations in accordance with the system, because there are a number of systems. There's a number of key manufacturers. You'll come across some of them, um, companies like Hacky, uh, Layer. There's a number of different systems. And the way that the industry looks at these is they group the systems into what they call families, based on the fixing method. So three different fixing methods are rosette, cup, and wedge. And I think in total, there are six, um, six families. So the way that it works, without getting too boring about it, is 
hacky will fit into a certain family. You go and get trained on hacky, um, and then you, you're effectively trained to, to erect anything else within that family, as long as you've had familiarization training on the specific product. If you then try and um, put up a system product from a different family, you'd have to go back to an accredited training center to, to be trained on that family of products. So as a system, they are quick to assemble, but they are more limited on what they can accommodate in terms of shape. And then the, the third one, which you might not really think about as, as a type of scaffold, but I think it's easy just to, to lump all these together. So mobile alumin, aluminium towers, what we tend to call plasma towers. Um, obviously they're built from modular panels, tubes, braces and boards. So similar to system in a way, but even more broken down into modules, very quick to put together, um, ideal for short duration work and you know, that sort of thing, you know, access to, to a window, whatever it might be. If we then look at the sort of standards of training, um, for tube and fitting, the standard is to have a scissors card, construction industry scaffolders record scheme. And that there's a number of different ones, but the principal ones are scaffolder and advanced scaffolder. And there is things like scaffold laborer, um, scaffold supervisor, scaffold manager. But those are the two that you most commonly come across. In terms of what the what is the difference between a scaffolder and an advanced scaffolder, fundamentally, scaffolders are trained to select and, um, and erect TG20 scaffolds. Advanced scaffolders are trained to erect and um, select and erect TG20 scaffolds, but they can also install bespoke design scaffolds. That doesn't stop a scaffolder being involved in the erection of a bespoke design scaffold, but they'd have to work under the supervision of an advanced scaffolder. So that's pretty much all it means. Obviously, there is a, there's a higher level of training for an advanced scaffolder, goes without saying. Um, for system, so... It's a similar card, it's a scissors card still, but we're looking at System Scaffold Product Training Scheme, SSPTS, another bit of a mouthful. So like I said before, training is in a product and other products in the same family can be erected after familiarization training, but other families require formal training. There's a link there to the, um, the scissors document, which has got the families on. And you can see I've highlighted there, not particularly clear, but it says System Scaffold in part one, part two, Hacky, where I've highlighted it in yellow. Now, the other thing you might come across is the tube and fitting scaffolders can go off and they can do a very quick course in erecting system cut, um, systems. So you can see on the top one there, I've got SSPTS layer and SSPTS cut block. So that put that tube and fitting scaffolder has been trained to put up system. The third sort is the mobile aluminum towers, so plasma, plasma towers. Um, plasma is the, is the ordinary qualification that we would see to put these things up. But actually scissors scaffolders can also put these up if they've done the um, CPD module. So if you look at the back of a scissors card, and I've highlighted it in blue there, it says scissors alloy tower module. And that means that these people can now go and put up um, aluminium towers. And to be fair to a, a, a proper scaffolder, an aluminium tower is going to be um, an absolute walk in the park. So there's a link to the plasma thing there. And just the other thing to bear in mind is that the there are a number of different types of plasma systems. Um, so the one there that you can see in the picture is very much a basic system, but you can get cantilevered systems, ballasted systems, bridging systems, and they're all covered under special advanced training. So they're not part of the standard card that you'd get. Okay, so that's types of scaffold. Um, in terms of terminology, hopefully this, this will help to understand some of the, some of the later things. Um, scaffolding is fundamentally built from, from standards. So the standards being uh, these bits that you can see going vertically. Um, so the vertical tubes, you then got the ledges, which run between the standards going that way, as you can see. And these are forming lifts, that'd be lift one, lift two, lift three. We've then got guardrails, which obviously are there to prevent people falling out and tow boards underneath to prevent materials falling out as well as um, to close the gap as well to get it within the um, work at high requirements. I think decking stands to reason. Um, the other thing you've then got is transoms, which span across that way. And they'll tend to be, there'll be one on the standards and one in between because they, they don't, they, you have to support every um, 1.2 meters generally. You've then got bracing. So you've got some ledger bracing here, which is tying the ledgers together as it goes up. You've got facade bracing or sway bracing, which is going across the front of the um, front of the standards. And you might also have plan bracing, which I don't think is shown on here. But if you imagine you're looking on top of the, uh, on top of the um, scaffold, you might see it going backwards and forwards through a lift. There's quite a lot of quite a lot to scaffolding in terms of the different components. Obviously, it sits on sole boards down the bottom, as you can see here, and generally it's going to require tying. So tying is obviously quite a big thing for scaffolding. We'll have a look at that in a moment. Um, 
with tube and fitting, there are only really four standard couplers that you'll get. You've got the right angle coupler called a double, um, a single, which obviously can, can spin around that point. A putt log coupler, which we use to clip transoms on. Um, some, yeah, sometimes got a transom clip. Um, and then couplers, which can, can sleeve tubes together. There are different other different things, but that's pretty much your four basic ones. So the other thing you have to think about is load classes. So you have to know what's going to go onto a scaffold to be able to choose the appropriate scaffold. So they, there are a number of different load classes. For the TG20, for the standard configurations, those, those load classes or the, or the loads are all assumed to be uniformly distributed loads, not point loads. If you end up with, with extreme point loads, you're always going to go down the bespoke design um, route. And you'd have to have a look at the limitations on a compliant sheet scaffold. Because ordinarily what they allow is one lift to be 100% loaded and one lift to be 50% loaded per scaffold at any one time. And if you think about the way that you'd use a scaffold, of course, if you, if you were um, starting to work from, from this lift here and you're starting to load this, this lift out, there's going to be a process to move materials up from, from one lift to the next. So you can see why you have the sort of 50% limitation. Um, anything in excess of the load class of point loads is going to require design. So what are our load classes? They're pretty easy, very light, light, general purpose and heavy duty. And for each one, you've got a uniformly distributed load in terms of kilonewtons or um, kilograms per square meter. And, a, and TG20 gives you an idea of what you could do with any one of those load classes. So hopefully that makes, makes sense. Pretty easy to understand, I think. So we talked about ties very briefly before. Um, the majority of, of scaffolds require tying, not all scaffolds. And we'll have a look at which don't in a moment, but nearly all of them require ties to a structure for strength and stability. And there's a number of different ways you can form ties. The ones which are most, um, most common within the literature are the drilled fixing type, um, where somebody comes along with a hill to drill, drill something in and then puts either a, a you know, sort of expanding anchor or a chemical anchor into the, uh, the concrete or the brickwork, whatever it is. And there's a number of different ways that they can be um, created. To some degree, I think this is down to the preference of the scaffolder, which one they'll use. Um, it also comes down to the load class they're trying to achieve and what, what the anchor is rated for. And different types of um, anchor are going to accommodate movement in a different way. So you can imagine, for example, this type of anchor is going to be great at preventing that kind of movement. That way, not so much. And you can see if, it got, if the scaffold got lifted out, this is just a little hook through, a, through an eye. It, there's no prevention in that, that way at all. Very similar for this one. Um, it can move up and down on this one. The band and plate is um, a pretty sturdy way of doing it as well. So you've got a, a band fitted into the wall with a bolt in it, and then tube goes in, the plate goes in, the tighten up. So a number of different ways. Um, and scaffolders would, would know the appropriate ones, but you'd have to tell them the load class that you're trying to achieve. Now, what I used to see more of, and that's probably because I'm working in the working in the water industry, TG20 really is, is designed around um, buildings either domestic or commercial um, so I, I worked for 15 years in the water industry putting where scaffolds were a common feature and actually drilling into things wasn't often very achievable um, sometimes there's something to drill into sometimes there wasn't but you didn't necessarily want to repair the damage um, you didn't you might not know what you're drilling into so there were other ways of achieving uh, physical ties um, they all have different restrictions and you have to check on TG20, the actual, um, the actual sort of guide, if you like, to understand which ones could be used. The, the strongest sort is the box tie. So you can see here's your scaffold and the, the, scaf the scaffold is physically tied in a box around a, a part of the structure, a bit of column or whatever else it might be. Um, obviously, whatever you're fixing it to needs to be checked from a temporary works perspective to make sure it's capable of, of taking the loading. Um, the next step down is the lip tie, where you can see the scaffold is tied with a bar behind, and also it's got a butting tube here, so it's, it's pre being prevented from moving in that direction, but not so much in that direction. Um, a through tie, you, you'll have seen these, I'm sure, on houses. One, one tube goes through, another tube sits behind, um, bracing it back against the, the inside of the window. And the absolute, well, I say the, the absolute worst, the, the weakest sort of tie is called a reveal tie. And what you can see here is a special tube, which has got uh, an, sort of an expanding bit here, like an acro prop, and it props itself into the inside of the window. Um, so that relies completely on friction. So the, the ones which are most restricted are, are these ones. You can use them, but in TG20, it tells you where you can use them and how many of the 
um, sort of anchored ties, you know, there's drilled in fixings you can replace with a reveal tie. So no more than 50%. And they rely on friction alone. I think they're, they are classed as a light duty um, tie from memory. So we know we've got to have ties. The other thing we need to think about is the, um, the layout of them. Now, the layout for a TG20 is, is um, specified within the compliance sheet. It will tell you how many ties you need to achieve per um, X square meters and ordinarily will be 16 square meters. They can then, to some degree, the scaffolder can arrange those ties as he sees fit to sort of accommodate the shape of the building or whatever he's working up against. So these are the different classes of ties, um, 2.7 kilonewtons up to 12.2. Tie classes very light up to heavy. And the suitable tire methods, these are the, um, the sort of substitutions, if you like, from the, um, the box ties, li um, reveal ties, lip ties, all those sorts of things. So it will, it will tell you within TG20 which ones you can substitute and how many you can substitute. Um, I think to some degree, this is why TG20 is a, is, it's a fantastic product, but you can't just have the compliance sheet on its own. You need to have the, the actual user guide, if you like, to understand um, the rules of the game. This is pretty much what a TG20 compliance sheet will tell you. It, it gives you the option of how do you want to space the ties, and all of these um, patterns will, will achieve the same, um, the same coverage, if you like, in terms of number of ties per square meters. It's just it comes down to um, preference of the scaffolder really, and how they're going to build the build the scaffolding in sequence, the, the installation of the ties. But ordinarily, what you're looking at for ties is every other bay, so that's every other bay and every other lift, if that makes sense. So that's the most simple way of thinking of ties, every other bay, every other lift. So what is a generally recognized standard configuration? So effectively, it is a design. Somebody has done the design for you though. Um, it already exists. So the calculations demonstrating strength and stability have been carried out for the proposed configuration. Um, it will be accompanied by some form of drawing and some form of instruction. So I said, don't get confused between standard configuration and TG20. It, it, it has almost become the, the one that people reach for. It's the sort of predominant one, but it isn't the only one. So National Access and Scaffolding Confederation, NASC, TG20, which I think is technical guidance. But some big companies also produce their own um, technical manuals, as they call them. And that is a series of standard designs that they've already created as a business that their scaffolders can follow. So one of the ones that I'm, I'm aware of does that an awful lot is a company called Alltrad. I'm sure you're aware of, I think they sponsor the French rugby team. Um, Alltrad have got a very, very thick manual. They Most of the work they do is in the petrochemical industry. So actually the NASC TG20 sheets probably don't really help them. Um, so they supplement them with their own and they've got far more than NASC. Um, the other sort of standard configuration, of course, is something like a system product where you've got a user manual and it will tell you how to build the system product, what you can do with it, where to put braces and all those sorts of things, basically an instruction manual. So that would be a compliant solution. One of the problems with compliance sheets, and I don't know if anybody's ever had to deal with scaffolders, and I don't mean this in a nasty way, it's just um, something that we used to have to do in the role I was in as a temporary works coordinator. So imagine I'm that, that good looking guy on the right hand side. And I've got a scaffolder on the left-hand side. So this is a sort of fairly common thing I would, I would hear. I've built your scaffold. I've tagged it. It's ready to use. And of course, the next thing I would ask is, can I have the compliance sheet? Because I need to provide evidence that I'm following the, the company temporary works procedures. Um, no, you don't need one. It's a compliant scaffold. Oh, OK. So yeah, I'm glad it is compliant, but I need the compliance sheet for my records. Well, there isn't one. Well, how is it compliant? is being built to the principles of TG20. And I think that's, that's a fairly common thing. If, if anybody's ever dealt with scaffolders, I don't think they're trying to pull the wool over your eyes necessarily. Perhaps it's down to misunderstanding. Most of the compliant scaffoldings, they have very standard spacings on, on standards, on ledgers, on transoms, on tie patterns, and all those sorts of things. So I, I can understand how people can get in the, in the mindset that if they follow those sort of general principles, then it is a compliant scaffold, but that's not the way it works. So it's a very common misconception. You can't have something that's compliant without a record of the standard configuration that's being used. And that's exactly what the work at height regulations say. There are some underlying principles, like say the spacing and all those sorts of things, but you still got to have a standard configuration sheet. If you can't find one because there isn't one, which is often the problem, then you're gonna to have to go and do some design or somebody's gonna to have to do some design. If of course you can use a compliant sheet solution, 
Um, the person who's choosing it is um, picking a product off the shelf in effect, but don't overlook the fact that that person then becomes the designer because of course they've got to make sure the solution they're choosing suits the um, suits the environment and the um, the intended use. And although something is pre-designed, this is obviously a bit of a, a, a aligning it with um, BS five nine seven five temporary works. But don't overlook the fact that although it's although it's pre-designed, um, you can you can use compliance sheets in very well, pretty high risk situations. So don't overlook the execution risk and consequence of failure risk. And therefore, make sure that there is in the, uh, an appropriate level of independent confirmation of the um, selection that you have used. Um, standard configurations, yeah, they can include some very tall, very complex scaffold, and you can put lots of add-on features on them as well. Um, can be used in very high-risk environments. So, if if you want, I can show you how the selection process works in a moment. Then you get an idea of what a scaffolder sort of looks at when they're going through this process. So what is covered by compliance sheets? So we've got tied independent scaffolds and independent scaffold with rakers. And I, it might seem really obvious, but what I'm saying at the bottom here, um, independent, and, I, and this is perhaps a, a common misconception in the industry, independent does not mean it's freestanding. It just means that the vertical loads are independent of the, of the structure that it's up against. So you'll see on this scaffold that there are two lines of standards, one on the back face, one on the front face, all the way around. So it's not a freestanding scaffold. So it's, it's a bit of a, a confusing term, I think. Um, now, some of these are freestanding. So we've got towers, um, which now in TG 2021, which came out obviously in 2021, um, can have wheels put on the bottom of them to, to roll them around. I've never seen one of those. I think you'd probably use a plasma tower if you needed to roll something around for inspection or, or access. Um, bird cage scaffolds. Um, so this is where you're trying to create a big sort of square platform on top of a scaffold. Ladder, ladder accesses, loading bays, chimney stacks, tied putt log. So this is, this is a putt log scaffold. And what you'll notice here is there's a line of standards on the outside of the scaffold. There's nothing on the inside. You see there's nothing in this, in this space here. And that's because they have what they call a putt log tube, which not very common anymore, but if you looked at the tube sideways on, it sort of goes down into a bit of a flat bit. And that flat bit there, is inserted into the brickwork of a, of a building. If that makes sense. So on the inside, the building is providing support to a putt log scaffold. So yeah, to some degree, TG20 compliance sheets, that's all of them. You are trying to find a, a, um, a square peg, trying to push it into a round hole. Um, they're very, very useful, but I think people try and manipulate them too much in industry to, to fit um, this, the problem they've got. So it gives you an idealized image of what the scaffolding is going to look like. Um, the height limits generally on TG2013, which is now out of date, you shouldn't really be using it, but you could go up to 16 meters from the um, paper compliance sheets. Now you use what they call the e-portal, which is what this, this image comes from the e-portal. Um, and using the e-portal, you can very quickly design a 50 meter high scaffold with lots and lots of extra features like, you know, you, this is a pavement lift. So we've got people walking underneath this. We've got bridged openings because there could be a door there or something for people to drive in and out of. So you can see how actually, yeah, I've in, in a matter of moments, I can generate a, um, a compliant scaffold, but you'd want somebody to check that depending on the consequence of failure and execution risk. So how hard is it actually to buy, to build, sorry. Um, and at the bottom, it gives you some other information about how the scaffold is to be built and the tie loads and all those sorts of things. Um, on the back of it, then it gives you the supporting information. It tells you exactly what you can do and what you can't do. You can see there's a few crosses there. So it says there may not be clad with sheeting or debris netting. So as I've gone through the selection process for this one, I've said, I'm not going to put any sheeting on it. Therefore, when it when it's, says it's acceptable, it creates very um, low tie loads. I could have one which had a tick there, but that tie load there would be much higher. Um, it then tells you about the loading criteria, the ties and all those sorts of things and anything else that I've added in. So you can see a two bay bridge, a pavement lift has been added in. Uh, and the great thing with these is if you choose the box, it gives you a little something there to put your squiggle on and sign the design off. So they're very good. Um, the other thing you need to know, you need to know about is the structure permeable or impermeable. And what that's, that's their terminology. But what they're looking at is how many windows have you got in it? If there are loads and loads of windows in this, um, behind the scaffold, you'd have to say that it was a permeable facade because the wind can blow through it and then blow the scaffolding over. The other thing to think about is it might be, um, it might be impermeable to start with, but does it stay like that for the duration of the, 
um, the scaffold being on site. So one thing that TG20 is not particularly useful for is demolition. So if you put a scaffold up the side of a building and then start demolishing the brickwork behind it, you can imagine all of a sudden the scaffold becomes much more exposed than you might have assumed it would be. And I say make, make sure you check what TG20 operational guide says for tolerances and alternatives to the ties and those sorts of things. So this is the um, TG20 portal. The selection bit is this one over here where you can go and choose your scaffold. You've then got the operational guide and really you wouldn't need to read the design guide down the bottom. That's for people who are doing bespoke designs, given things like um, structural properties of tubes and those sorts of things. Okay, so that's compliant scaffolds. The other type, I said, is design scaffolds. And you know, the question I suppose is, well, what do you need a design scaffold for? Um, anywhere where you cannot find a standard configuration, you're going to have to then get a specific design carried out. And that's what the work at high regulations, of course, say. Um, so some of the things that would not be covered by standard configurations, and of course, there's lots, anything that you can't find a sheet for. Anything where you've got lifting arrangements other than a gin wheel. So you can have a gin wheel attached to a scaffold. That's not a problem. It tells you that on the compliance sheet. This isn't a gin wheel. This is a proper hoist. A hoist is not covered by a compliance sheet. Um, what about using scaffold for um, temporary works? So this isn't really a scaffold we're using for access. This is to support something being built. So false work and crash decks and those sorts of things. They are not um, scaffolds in the sense of compliance sheets. They need bespoke design every single time. And actually something that gets overlooked is handrails. And I think this has been overlooked by the industry um, for a long time. So this handrail here, this guardrail, that is part of the... Um, part of the compliant design. So that's part of it. That's not a problem at all. If that was a TG20, just ignore the hoist. But if you had a just a handrail on site to prevent um, people falling into a, um, a shallow trench or something, that is not something that's achievable through TG20. So it always requires design, which is often overlooked. Um, really complex loading. So not uniformly distributed loads, varying loads, point loads, all those sorts of things will not be covered by TG20. And I was trying to find a picture of a scaffold at the top of a mountain. Um, actually quite hard to find one of the things that you'll see with tg20 is that it's fairly limited on when you can erect some sorts of scaffolds and some sorts of locations most of the um most of england's okay but as soon as you get to places like the west coast of scotland or the the tips of cornwall and the sides of um wales and places like that because the exposure is much greater um the software will generally say, I'm sorry, there is no standard configuration available for this because the wind loading is going to be so great. Um, the, the other thing is you could be in the middle of England, absolutely fine. But if you're up at the top of a mountain, then generally the, the software will pick up on that because you have to tell it where you are. And it will say this area is too exposed for a, for a standard configuration to be used. So anywhere exposed can, um, is going to need a, spe a specific design. Um, when we do the design, it's going to be to EN 12811, um, which is where we get some of the um, system um, structural properties from and to the TG20 design guide. We then manage that process through 5975 and of course company procedures on management and temporary works. Um, designs need checking can, depending on um, the level of risk and the level of complexity that could either be an internal check or an external check again in, in accordance with 5975. So one of the things I was quite keen on when, when I took over scaffolding at Costain was that we we actually properly recorded what we were using scaffolding for. When we had really complex scaffolds that we were using um, for sort of pure temporary work solutions, if you like, there was a great record of temporary works brief and exactly what the loading was and who had approved and all those sorts of things. When we came to access scaffolds, there was less information. So this gives you an idea of how we now record that information. So a brief to record what we're trying to do with the scaffold and where are we putting it? When do we want it? So when do we want it on site can be really, really relevant because sometimes within the standard configurations, there are limitations on having scaffolds up over, over winter because of the um, possibility of storms, obviously. Um, do we want it sheeted or netted? All those sorts of things. Are there any other drawings we need we can reference? And who's actually going to be coordinating this on site? Some of these things might be um, things that we know as a user, but they might be things that we just have to give to the scaffolder to, to sort of come and tell us what we need in effect. So, you know, things like the loading requirements, the size of it, the access requirements, all those sorts of things. Um, when that comes back, don't forget, we then need to check the design. Somebody needs to check it, make sure that what we've been given meets what, what we need and what we wanted, um, and that there has been a suitable check done on that design. We've also got to think about what it's sat, sat on and what it's tied to. So that's going to require some sort of temporary works coordinator approval, um, permit to load. 
make sure we've got a method statement, make sure we've got everything in place, and then obviously um, approval to go and put it up. And finally, once it's been put up, making sure we check that the design's been followed, that the ties have been tested. So TG20 will tell you how often ties have to be tested and what happens if you get a failure. Um, and also the, sort of the values to proof load test ties to. Um, we've got to make sure we've got a handover certificate, we've got tags on it, all those sorts of things. And then just a record, we, somebody's, signed, somebody's handing it over to us, so that'll be an advanced scaffolder. And then our, our approval to put it into service. Now, if it is a pure temporary works scaffold, it's also going to need a permit to load from the temporary works coordinator, which is this last bit down at the bottom. So it's a, it's a fairly easy process to get right, and it's it's just a question of collecting the right information, really. Um, something that you might come across is the need for a handover certificate or handing over certificate, some people call them. I would say that they are a, a very sensible thing to have, but the way that the, um, that the regulations really stack up on this one is that if you are handing over a scaffold to a, a company and they are going to take on responsibility for inspection and maintenance, then yes, you need to hand it over. But what we often do is obviously get a scaffold put up by a scaffold company and then also pay them to come back on a weekly basis to inspect it and give us a inspection record. In those cases, because we haven't transferred the responsibility for maintenance and inspection, you actually technically don't need a handing over certificate. But I think they're always something which is useful to have anyway, just as a record. And then obviously the tag, which tells people when it was last inspected and the class of use and all those sorts of things. So they can trace that back through the file. Um, there are lots of different types of scaffold, and this is just how we classify them in, our, in, in cost aid um, from a temporary works perspective. There's lots of different types of scaffolds. Here we've got tied tube and fitting independent, freestanding, bird cages, non-special um, scaffolds, things like access to the back of formwork um, at the very bottom end. What about some seating here for people at a concert or something? Some of these things can be quite high risk. Um, we've also, we can also build scaffolding from the top down um, so um, suspended scaffolds, truss out scaffolds, temporary storage built from scaffolds, protection decks, power line crossings. There's lots of different types of things. Um, then we've got system scaffolds, aluminium towers, and using scaffold components in a non-scaffold manner, basically, so we've got edge protection down here. And then obviously we're, we're classifying these from um, very low up to, up to high cat three checks. So I think any any organisation requiring scaffolding really needs to have a sort of think about how they want it to be managed on their on their projects, and then just to help people try and understand what they might need in any one situation. At the top we have generally recognised standard configurations, and at the bottom we've got bespoke design. Who gets to you know? Do you need a brief? Who who does the design? Who does the design check? Do you need a check certificate? Do you need a permit to load? All those sorts of things really got to be quite clear because people will get confused otherwise. One of the reasons why the industry doesn't really like um, TG20 all the time is because the image on the sheet doesn't necessarily look like what's actually being, being built on site. And I think it's fair to say that it, yeah, it, it probably does follow the design, but actually the image doesn't look very good. So what, what we recommend is that you always take a photo of what's being built so you can evidence what was, um, what was built, what was approved, and the fact that it was checked against the um, stipulations on the compliance sheet. And yes, it was in conformity with it. So last but not least, scaffolding inspection. Um, what are the requirements? Okay, so it's got to be inspected after installation. That's generally done by the scaffolder as part of the handover process. Um, after alteration, which effectively becomes a new handover process itself, every seven days, and after exceptional events, which could be high winds, um, vibration levels, flooding, collision, all those sorts of things. Um, inspection after handover should be carried out by an independent person, so free of fear or favour, but... Uh, it's not actually a, a strict requirement. You could have the same scaffolder coming back in on a weekly basis, inspecting it. But I think it's probably a bit like marking your own homework. So I'd always try and get somebody independent to do the inspection. Um, who can do the inspection? So the scissors, um, again, come in here. You've got scaffold inspection for basic scaffolds and advanced scaffold inspection. So obviously the one on the left-hand side, they can only inspect basic scaffolds, which is what we'd call compliant scaffolds, so your TG20s. Your advanced scaffolder can also inspect um, advanced scaffolds. I think there's a lot of people who um, aren't scaffolders who have this card, and that's fine for checking the really basic things. It is possible for non-scaffolders to get these cards if they've got the experience, but I think it's questionable whether or not that's particularly sensible. I think if you're going to be having somebody 
inspect an advanced scaffold, you probably want to make sure they are a scaffolder themselves. Um, and indeed, on the back of the scaffold cards, this never used to be here, but from 2016, um, you can see now on a scaffolder card, they've got basic scaffold inspection, and on an advanced card, they've got advanced scaffold inspection. So if you're looking at somebody with an older card, they might have to go and do a CPD event to actually get that added onto their card. Um, but all new cards get that on from the word go now. And that's it. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Tom. Quite all right. Um, we're just looking at it in the chat at the moment. Um, we have obviously invited everyone to uh, ask any questions, but I think you've covered off uh, uh, a significant amount of information which uh, reduces the, uh, the requirements for questions, which is fantastic. I think what is great, though, is because you've given your, your contact details as well, should there be any questions outside of this presentation? Um, if you're happy for an individual to get in touch, that would be Maybe, fantastic yeah. once this is uploaded onto the IOSH branch link. Yes, I'll send you the details after sending the, the uh, slides. Uh, oh, sorry, this is locked out. I was just going to very quickly show you the selection process. I don't know if people are interested in this, but it gives you an idea for what, what scaffolders are faced with. So it's, it's actually a very, very intuitive system. You know, the first question is, what are you trying to achieve? Well, I want to do an independent scaffold. Okay. Where do we want to do it? So for some reason, this is now keep, keeps on defaulting for me to a place in Manchester. It's not my home address, by the way. Um, so there we go. You can you can obviously change the address. Okay. Do you want two meters? Sorry, Karen. You're not sharing the screen. Oh, am I not? Sorry. Yeah. Ah, right. Um, We've got the presentation up still. Right. Let's try this one. A better? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Tom. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So what I'm saying is, here's here's the TG Twenty software. So it's all on it's all on a website now. So yeah, you choose your type of scaffolding you want and the location in the UK where you're having it. Um, you then choose the lift heights. Do you want three meter or two meter lifts? So two meters is a standard. Um, how tall do you want it? Okay, that doesn't really matter. How wide? Um, are you going to fully board it or are you just going to keep the top two lifts boarded? So let's say we fully board it and you've obviously got other options as well. What do you want to use it for? General purpose. How wide do you want it? Let's have five boards and two on the inside. Um, we'll put some debris netting on it. Standard transoms, standard tubes. Um, we'll put a pavement lift at the bottom, a protection fan. Um, how, how do you want to tie the pavement lift? Um, okay, let's have it fairly standard. How far up do you want to put the protection fan? Let's put it up there. Now, I'm putting a lot of extras on this. It now might turn around and say you can't do it, um, but we'll see. Let's put a, you can put a bridge in there so to cover something in like a, an opening below, like I said before. Whereabouts do you want to put that bridge? Um, if you're doing block work, do you want to put a hop up on it? Let's assume not. Put an external ladder access tower. How do you want to tie it? Okay, what tie patterns do you want? And there we go. So it then generates the sheet and you can see it in elevation and the elevation from the other way. It gives you loads, tells you your tie duties, all those sorts of things. Do you want to include a checker signature on the box so I can sign it there if I wanted to save the PDF? And hey, presto, hopefully, if it's going to appear. There we go. There's my design completed. So it's very, very fast. And all of the extra bits I added on, like the pavement fans and the lifts, they just come as separate compliance sheets on the end of it. And it's just, just a one license requirement, Tom, or do you have to buy multiple licenses for? It's, um, it's one, it's, it's, it's licensed based on the email address. And I think if you're an NAC member, which we are, it's 90 pounds a year. If you're not, I think it's probably a couple of hundred pounds a year. Um, but you, you don't have to, you know, I'm not trying try to tell you how to cheat NASC, but you could effectively register one person, one person's email address and then share the login details around. There's no, nothing to stop you doing that. Okay. And we just have to make sure that anybody using it logs out before the next person logs in because it won't let you log in otherwise. But um, that's what a lot of our projects do. You know, they, they arrange access on the pro one project at a time. Mm. That makes sense. Thanks, Tom. Okay. 
Perfect. That was great. Really, really found that ex extremely useful, Tom, and thank you very much. And uh, like I said, this will be shared uh, within the next couple of days on the Irish branch link. Um, and in the meantime, if anybody wants to get in touch with Tom, I did share his contact details at the beginning. Um, but other than that, uh, please get in touch with the Irish Midlands West branch and then we can uh, transfer your, your request over to Tom indirectly uh, it, whilst we're waiting for that, that to be uploaded onto the system. Tom, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I still don't think any chats have come through. No, that's it. Uh, yeah, we've got some uh, some people just saying thank you very much. Great presentation and uh, yeah, you're very welcome. Extra at the end, yeah, yeah. I, th I think that was really helpful as well. The the last bit, Tom, uh, just giving a bit of a uh, guidance about what what it actually can look like. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I didn't show you the, um, I probably should have showed you the um, TG20 operational guide. I, just very, very briefly, am I sharing my screen again? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I, right, the operational guide. Let me just show you this briefly. So I said you need to sometimes have the operational guide to understand the rules of the game where, it, where, you, know, where you sort of deviate from the compliance sheet. This is the this was issued used to be issued as a paper book now it's only available on the e portal i think it might come out as a paper book in future but actually i wouldn't worry about it because it's great on here because you can just search for exactly what you're looking for so let's say rakers and you can use rakers as a substitute for ties and it tells you exactly how you can do it where you can do it and all those sorts of things so i'd strongly recommend access to to this if you have scaffolding on your sites that's brilliant there's the operational guide for TG20. Yeah. Great. So, that was brilliant, Tom. So, yeah, I've got other few people just saying about that it's really informative, uh, really interesting. And um, are any references to the talk of screws and bolts as per loads? There's one question that's just come through. Uh, sorry, what was, what's the question? Any? Any references to the talk of screws? Oh, okay. And that's good. Bolts. Yeah as per yeah. loads uh that is a very good question um so the the tie loads are given in tg20 um i i think what i what you'd be doing of course is then going to a company say like hilti or whatever to then um specify the the fixing detail that you then required so i suppose that'd be proprietary i don't know if the talk of the bolts is in there in tg20 because i think it would depend on the product that you're using to form the tie Okay, hopefully that answers your question, Marios. Perfect, thank you for that, Tom. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that is it. Um, just shy of uh, half past seven. Uh, so yeah, really, really informative, Tom. And uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we can get you to come along again uh, later I don't, on I don't know year. what I've got left. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find something if people want me back. <laughs> That's uh, brilliant. Yeah, really appreciate your your knowledge and uh, your skill set ar around the temporary works and the scaffolding aspects. So with that, I'm going to stop recording and.